Craig Sylvie shot to fame with his coming-of-age bestseller, Jasper Jones. Now he's back with a modern-day fable about a masked boy hero who wants to make things better in his neighbourhood. Craig Sylvie, welcome to Booktopia. Thanks for having me. Would you like to introduce us to the hero of The Amber Amulet? I would love to. The Amber Amulet features uh, a hero by the name of the Masked Avenger, who is the secret identity of a 12-year-old boy called Liam McKenzie, who believes in energy. Mm -hmm. He believes that there is uh, energy embedded in everyday items. And, you know, at a molecular level, that they, uh, when in contact with with him, uh, will bestow him with uh, certain specialised attributes. Uh, For example, the constituent nickel in coins will give him speed and agility and and et cetera. And so uh, when he affixes these items onto his power belt, uh, you know, it culminates in, uh, you know, a superhero by the name of the Master Avenger, who with his uh, trusty sidekick, Richie, the Power Beagle, uh, navigate the, uh, the grim, dark world of Franklin Street, and he keeps his neighbourhood safe by performing astonishing duties. But he's particularly worried by uh, the woman at the end of the street. Yes, we'll come back to the woman at the end of the street in a moment. But where does this idea for this hero come from? Because when I was reading the book, I kept thinking about the film Amelie right. and about this desire to make things better. What, what did that start with for you? That's an interesting point. Um, I think it all started uh, with believe it or not, Richard Feynman, in a, in a, in a book that is, you know, uh, you know, involves itself with a great deal of pseudoscience and nonsense, um, <laughs> it actually started with a Nobel Prize winning physicist. <laughs> um, and I remember he was, uh, I remember listening to him talk about the carbon cycle mm. and trees and uh, the, the connectivity of things and, uh, you know, how sunlight is used to knock the, the, the carbon out of carbon dioxide and, they, and trees use this to grow, that trees are actually formed from, from the air itself. And that fascinated me mm-hmm. that, uh, that that's something so, you know, profound could, uh, could come from just simply the, the atmosphere, you know. Um, but also uh, the notion that um, when you release that carbon again, you know, be it with, uh, you know, a spark of, of, uh, of concentrated energy, be that heat or something like mm. that, when the carbon binds together again with the oxygen, you get this sort of holy conflagration known as fire. And so it's that sunlight that went into making the, uh, you know, the, the tree itself is suddenly released and, and the whole cycle brings itself back again. And it just fascinated me. And I started thinking about um, trees as these doors of energy. And then I started thinking about whether or not our constituent parts could argue the same thing, that we were stores of energy. And I started thinking about the nature of that, about potential energy and trapped energy. I see you nodding slowly at me. No, no, How no, on no. earth did this happen? But yeah, I mean, so, and so from that point of time, that, that notion really, really fascinated me. And I started thinking about that on a kind of philosophical level as well. And so from there, uh, obviously my next thought was about a small boy and a beagle. <laughs> and uh, you know how he could bring these sorts of processes together. Because you talk about science and, and nonsense, but um, in fact, some of the things that he believes about energy are things that a lot of people in new age, sort of with new age perspectives also believe, particularly this, this sense that he has that there is special energy in gemstones yes. and in minerals. When when Liam, your boy hero, starts exploring that, I thought, oh my God, that is such a new age belief. It's it's actually quite amazing. You know, I, I had this notion, um, you know, of him believing in, you know, specific imbued properties, you know, at an atomic level and that sort of thing. And um, I thought it might've been a bridge too far. But then I started looking into it, crystal hearing, uh, healing and, you know, realignment of chakras and, and that sort of thing. And uh, it seems to be a lot of people seem to be very fond of these ideas, you know. So uh, marrying that together was was really quite fun. And in fact, um, when I started researching the kind of gemstones and uh, objects that he would be particularly interesting, interested in, you know, what might be considered precious to a master avenger. Um, Amber was one of those things that really struck me because Amber has a very, very interesting uh, history with with humans. Um, What struck me as well is that Amber itself, which is fossilized tree resin, and the resin is sort of acts like the kind of blood of a tree. Mm. You know, it 
it attends to its wounds and saves it from infection and that sort of thing. Um, but once it's fossilized over millions of years and washes up on shorelines, it was used as uh, as a medicine yeah. by, uh, you know, oh, I, I think shamans used it, didn't they? I think it does have those sorts of almost magical properties or people believe that. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. I mean, anywhere from ancient China to mm. uh, Native Americans to, you know, latter day weirdy beardies, uh, really believe that amber had these kind of uh, healing properties that could, you know, recalibrate your, you know, solar chakras and, uh, you know, remove. And what struck me the most, and when I knew I had my, my key ingredient, was uh, when I read that it could uh, remove uh, negative energy from mm. your body and, and remove pain. Um, and so then I, then I knew that the Master Avenger had this... Uh, this perfect element. Let's talk about the Master Avenger uh, a little bit in relation to Jasper Jones because it's impossible in a way not to sort of look for connections between them and I guess they're both outsiders aren't they? In a lot of respects yeah I mean um, they're, they're both solitary mm. you know and they're both kind of uh, happy to be so in a lot of respects they're uh, both quite self-contained um, you know, Liam or the Master Avenger wants to sort of intersect with society, but doing it in his own sort of way. You know, is uh, the the links between them are, don't really go beyond that. I don't think. Except that I think that what they also both share is a is a very charming, very beguiling innocence. You're obviously quite interested in writing, I think, about innocence as a quality that that we possess for a very fleeting amount of time. And yeah. and I think innocence is particularly interesting to think about because we live in a very cynical time. That's right. And I think that's what adulthood does. We we tend to start couching our own internal philosophies with these kind of untruths and these lies that tend to divert and distract us from the things that are difficult to deal with. And so what made this... Uh, story very very interesting for me um, is the moment of naivety that moment of very childish direct questioning which has um, which catalyzes you know a very very big change you know it cuts through those layers of, of lies and and you know careful couching and you know you can't avoid it and there is that lovely sense isn't there with children that that they see things in such simplistic ways that the idea of being able to fix things in your street, in your neighborhood, is so obvious that, you know, if you see that someone's car tires are going down, then you just pump them up. Right. Don't you? Yeah. I mean, our Master Benja has aspirations to, uh, you know, to, to broaden his sphere of safety, you know. Um, but for the time being, he's sort of contained to, to Franklin Street. And he can't patrol his neighbourhood at all times, unfortunately. So he developed uh, what is known as a magnetometer. So he plants magnets outside the front doors of, uh, of every house and he has his own magnet and that has this wonderful sense of connectivity. So he knows when people are in trouble, you know, and he plants two in, the, uh, in front of the, the house of Joan, who's the woman he's particularly concerned by. Yes, now why is he concerned about Joan? Well, uh, you know, there's, there seems to be a certain degree of domestic disturbance. There's the odd ruckus and loud quarrel. And so uh, that, that leads him to, you know, to, to become concerned by her. And he, this culminates in, in him, after a particularly successful night of being helpful in his neighbourhood, he leaves her a small note. A lot of this book's um, exposition is, is told through letters and that sort of thing, which we sort of scanned, the, the real objects, and, and left them in there. And he writes her a small note asking simply, again, this very, very naive direct question, are you unhappy? Mm. And asks her to tick a box, either yes or no. And, uh, you know, obviously she affirms his suspicions and uh, suddenly she's in, you know, she's part of his duty of care. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm wondering, this is a fable, isn't it? It's a modern day fable about how, perhaps it's about how we should engage more with our neighbours, engage more with our community. Is that part of the take home message here? Yeah, I really like that angle. Certainly, certainly. Uh, it's a book about a lot of things. You know, as someone, uh, I met a book bookseller recently who said that um, it, the book itself is smaller than you expect, but it's bigger than you think. And um, <laughs> I thought that was really sweet. You know, yeah. it can be interpreted in a number of different ways. You know, it's a book that really believes in in that energy. You know, it's a book that believes in that thought that 
one of those small naive moments can catalyze a, a big change and you know that's that's um, has fundamentals in physics and, and chemistry and that sort of thing it's it's uh, a book about realizing that potential energy and trapped energy and, and that sort of thing it is absolutely a book about community and goodness and uh, you know exploring those sorts of things and and and, and doing the right thing um, but you know curiously enough interestingly enough I don't know if this is interesting to other, anyone other than me but uh, once I finished this book, and I thought I was writing a book about energy and, and, and kindness mm -hmm. and honesty, mm -hmm. um, but I finished this story and I looked at all the main ingredients and everything that went into it and, and all this research I did about, you know, amber and, and science and Nikola Tesla and, you know, all the stones I, I uncovered and I realized it was really kind of a book about uh, me. It was, it's actually kind of the most personal thing I've ever written. And strangely enough, and I don't expect anyone to interpret it in this way, but you know, I just finished uh, an enormous tour with my book, Jasper Jones. And you know, I'd never expected that uh, you know, I'd be doing quite so much talking about myself. Um, and I found myself in a very, very interesting position. You know, I've been writing for over 10 years now, and I never expected how much, of it, how much it would require of me. I, I never expected just how much uh, of my life it would usurp. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you want to write well and if you want to write something that is meaningful and something that lasts, you've really got to give yourself over to it. And it's an interesting thing about writing, is, especially a novel, is that it becomes very obsessive. Um, you tend to give yourself over into this fictional universe and it requires more and more of you. It's kind of like a parasite, you know, it starts leeching more and more of you and you become a less reliable member of uh, the real world. You know, you start attending to your fictional people, uh, you know, more often than not at the expense of people that are real and deserve better. Um, and so you realize that there are certain sacrifices that you need to make. And uh, for me, at least, it's starting to ratchet up further and further and, and kind of getting worse and worse and then you become you know you move from that private world that very very intimate world of of creating a novel and crafting a story into an incredibly public one and you know suddenly you, you're just literally not at home you know mm -hmm. and, it, and it requires something else of you I'm not complaining about my job I have the most wonderful job in the world but realizing that this is what it requires is uh, something I've had to think about recently and something that is a little troubling because at some point you need to consider the question, is it worth it? Mm. And so these things were on my mind after I came home from a long stint of touring and you know, I wrote this story and I realized that uh, unbeknownst to me, I'd written a story about this young boy who's much more comfortable in his nocturnal universe as the master Avenger. And he believes in this fiction and uh, he's doing it for the good of strangers, you know, and um, he gets himself in this bind whereby he sacrifices something precious and something intimate, something involved with family, uh, something that isn't his to give away and suddenly he has this decision to make. Yeah, we mustn't give away more than that. But so you're obviously thinking at a deep level about your own creative energy, which doesn't reside in stones but resides in your imagination and about whether or not perhaps you need to create an alter ego to go out into the public world so that the private Craig Sylvie can stay home and keep writing. Well, the curious thing about the master Avenger, and uh, you know, I think this is true of a lot of superheroes, is that they feel much more comfortable uh, as their alter ego. So if, you know, it, and you know, his, his everyday is, uh, is the mask. Um, so I think personally, I actually feel much more comfortable at, at the desk. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, the fiction is your mask. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It tends to it tends to work that way. Let's talk a little bit about the object that this book is, uh, because it is such a beautiful object, and so much love and care has gone into the design. Um, you've worked with this illustrator, Sonia Martinez. Let's just talk a little bit about what you've achieved here with these sorts of pages. I'm going to try and just hold that up so that you can see one of these beautiful pages. I tend to be something of uh, a very detail-oriented maniac. Um, <laughs> so I had a very, very strong idea of what I wanted, a very, very strong idea of um, uh, what influences we wanted to marry together. 
um, I could see it very, very clearly in my mind. I mean, a lot of this book's exposition is with letters and notes and that sort of thing. And I knew that I wanted to integrate them into the story and, and so that the, the art is kind of unavoidable. You need to follow it in order to traverse the story itself. Uh, and I wanted those scrapbook entries to be um, as they are, you know, from, from old geological tomes and, you know, with the kind of National Geographic feel and encyclopedia feel and that sort of thing. I felt marrying that together with the kind of noir detective comic book angle as well would, would work really well. Thank you very much, Craig Sylvie. Thanks for having me. This modern day fable has the kind of charm and good looks that makes it appealing for readers of all ages.